on today's Story Beat. Study, be patient, breathe, but study. I see the things that I didn't do when I was younger, and I see the things that my son does. He literally watches, I want to say four movies a day, probably not that many, but he watches at least a couple every day. And he studies them, and he has the ability to watch them over and over and over again. And that was the defense mechanism that I had when I was younger that I did not want to do. And I think it robbed me from the ability to go deeper in my craft. So the degree to which you're willing to watch things over and over again and study them and absorb them, I think is a, is a great tool for any artist. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuton, a podcast for the creative mind. StoryBeat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, actor, director Michelle Danner, is also an acting coach at the Los Angeles Acting School who specializes in the Meisner, Strasberg, Adler, Hagen, Chekhov, and Stanislavski techniques. Alongside Larry Moss, she's also the founding and artistic director of the Edgemar Center for the Arts. In 2006, Michelle made her feature film directing debut with How to Go Out on a Date in Queens, winning the LA Film Awards Best Acting and Best Movie Awards. Her 2013 film, Hello Herman, catalogs the effect that peer abuse, parental neglect, and the general coarsening of society has on a typical high school student. Michelle has acted in and directed over 30 plays in the Los Angeles and New York areas. With her favorite acting credits cited as the Dramalogue award-winning Tennessee Williams' The Rose Tattoo. Among her other award-winning stage work, she produced The Night of the Black Cat at Edgemar. She directed the world premiere of Mental, the musical, and she wrote and directed You're on the Air, an improvisation-based comedy. Michelle also produced and acted in the award-winning short Dos Corazones, directed by Larry Moss, and she was voted favorite acting coach by the readers of Backstage. Notable projects Michelle has directed include Bad Impulse with Paul Servino, Ticket to the Circus, which is a one-woman play about the life of Norris Church Mailer, starring Ann Archer. And most recently, she produced and directed the feature Miranda's Victim, a biographical crime drama depicting the origins of the well-known Miranda Warning. The movie stars Abigail Breslin, Luke Wilson, Andy Garcia, Donald Sutherland, Ryan Phillippe, Kyle McLaughlin, Murray Enos, Taryn Manning, and Emily Van Camp. I've seen Miranda's Victim and can tell you it's an intense and deeply emotional story about how the legal system can be impacted and changed by overcoming injustice and challenging circumstances. I highly recommend it to you. So for all those reasons and many more, it's a truly great honor and privilege for me to welcome the brilliant, prolific, multi-talented Michelle Danner to Story Beat today. Michelle, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for being with me today. So let's go back in time just a little bit. Tell us a bit of your history. You've been at the acting, writing, and directing game and also teaching for a little while. How old were you when the showbiz bug first bit you? Well, according to my parents, I was, you know, four, two years old or three. <laughs> my dad opened the very, very first William Morris agency in Paris. Wow. And uh, yeah, so uh, he brought the agents home from the office and I apparently was told that I would tap dance on the coffee table and do imitations of Hitchcock and Ed Sullivan and Judy Garland. And so I was a little entertainer way back then. You... I remember vividly going to my dad's office and playing under his desk and watching people come in, talk about their dreams and acting their dreams as entertainers. So I had a great childhood in Europe and France, traveled all over Europe. So you were already in show business right from the get go because your father was in show business. Yes. So you yes. were exposed to all of it. Did you go to see movies and plays and all that when you were very young? I was avidly. I went everywhere. I remember even at some point cutting classes, but that's when I was a teenager 
to go see uh, Young Frankenstein with Gene Wilder sure. and Marilyn Kahn on the Champs Elysees. I remember not going to school for that and then getting in trouble. Um, but uh, that, uh, yeah, I mean, I loved museums. I loved books. I created a little library in my closet where I would go and, you know, with a candle. And now when I think back on it, I go, thank God I didn't set fire to the whole closet. But I was, I loved to read. I loved to go to museums. I loved to go to the theater. I loved um, going to the movies. I was always into the arts. And to this day, I do the exact same thing. And now that I have two kids, I take them everywhere and expose them to everything. Well, that's great. Are they are either of them interested in being in the business? Yes, one of them is graduating from USC School of Dramatic Arts and Cinematic Arts in May. He just loves anything that has to do with storytelling. And people hate to go to the movies with us because we turn to each other and keep whispering things. And <laughs> what about this shot? And what about this moment? And, and my other kid is actually not really into the arts. He's an athlete and into business. So they, they're always different. They don't come out alike. So you have many different skill sets. You've obviously been an actor for a long time. You also direct, you've written, and you teach. Um, among many other things I'm sure that you do within the arts. I'm wondering, is there one or more of those things that you really think of yourself as? For instance, when people ask me what I do, I usually tell them I'm a writer, though I do other things as well. Is there something that you think of yourself primarily as? Um, I don't think so, because I think of myself primarily as a storyteller. And that's, 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 that's exactly that's, what you are. You are a storyteller. On every medium, I'm a storyteller. And I'm fascinated by stories. I always tell my students when I teach, I go, you know, they, that's the oldest profession around the campfire. I mean, people think that it's that oldest profession, but it's not that profession. Storytellers are the oldest profession. It's interesting. Some people think that the storyteller of a movie or a play or a TV show is the writer or the director, but not the actors. But I think every member of the crew is a part of the storytelling, don't you? Most definitely. Everybody in front of the camera, behind the camera, the whole entire team. And that's why when you watch a movie or a TV show and you watch the scroll at the end of it, and that it took that kind of a village to make it happen, everybody's a storyteller that's involved. Indeed, indeed. How long do you think you were at the acting game and then the directing game before you thought you were actually really good at it, good enough to make a career out of it. Oh my God, I don't think I'm good at it. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I have been wondering if I have handed down my kids this complex of insecurity. I mean, for instance, with Miranda's victim, I'm, I was like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And my, my kid is like, no, you know, my kids are like, you made a good movie, you made a good movie. Uh, I'm, I'm beyond, and listen, I think every artist on the face of this earth has something in common. Everybody is insecure. There's just different degrees of insecurity. I don't have insecurity so that it paralyzes me from achieving things. Uh, definitely not. But uh, I could tell you that I'm highly insecure. Well, many people, including me, at times have imposter syndrome. Is that what you're saying? Do you feel like you're you're just fooling people that you can do this a little bit, but you're really not going to be able to do it? Is that how you think? Well, not, no, no, I, I know that I can do it. I know that I have, you know, the, the skills and the knowledge. Um, I just don't know that the outcome is any good. I, I think that I, I feel confident that I know how to do it. Mm -hmm. it, it your, uh, your skill set is that you know how to do this, but you're not sure whether others will like what you've done. Is that the idea? Well, I don't really care about that part, <laughs> you know, it's well, of course, it's better to to have some success than failing at it because it's more painful. But I mean, I listen, I've gotten great reviews and I've gotten horrific reviews and and, and both for the same movie, by the way, <laughs> for the same play. So I know that roller coaster. I'm very well aware of what that is. You know, at the end of the day, that just rolls off of me. No, I just, you know, I'm just not sure that I, I just want people to see it. I, of course, I'd like people to like it, 
But I mean, if they don't like it, I, I think every artist has to, at some point, please themselves first. And, and so be it. And I think that's the, the biggest key of all is that you've got to please yourself first. I'm sure you would agree with that. Yeah, and it falls where it falls. Of course, like I said, I like it better when, you know, more people like it than not. So let's um, you you brought up Miranda's victim. Let's talk about that for a moment. Aside from the obvious that the stories about the development of the Miranda warning that we all know from movies and TV shows forever. What's the personal side of the story? What attracted you to Miranda's victim in the first place? What attracted me is that it was a story about survival and it was a story about justice and standing up for your truth. And for a young girl who's 18 years old and we're in 1963 in Phoenix, Arizona, with all the society pressures that surround her, that she was able to be that strong. It's a story of strength and stick to her guns no matter what and relive this nightmare that happened to her. Um, the other thing that I really liked about the story I went to Phoenix, I walked her path that night when she walked at the Paramount. I went to the bus stop and I started, I had an unexpected response when I stood at the bus uh, stop where she got off, I started to cry. Mm. I was like, I said, well, you know, if she hadn't taken that bus, if she had had the crush on her coworker, she would have taken an earlier bus and it wouldn't have been her. She wouldn't have been the one that got kidnapped, uh, you know, but, um, but then I thought to myself, but well, it had to be her because she had to stop it. This was a serial rapist on the street and and she was going to speak out. She was going to fight for him to be brought to justice. So then I thought, well, it had to be her. I mean, I really like the theme of, you know, the, the if you miss the bus by five minutes, your life completely changes. Well, that's for, <laughs> true for all kinds of things in life, isn't there? Yes, it certainly is. So um, what were the biggest challenges in getting the movie produced? That movie fell into place. I don't want to say quite easily because everything is work, but um, Donald Sutherland was the first actor that came on board. And um, he always reminded me of my father. And the moment when he said yes, I felt that the, my father's no longer here on earth, but he, that he was looking down and helping out. Um, I got along very well with Mr. Sutherland. He is just such a legend. Uh, he was a, an extraordinary actor to work with. And then I, um, and then Andy Garcia came on board and then I uh, met with Abigail Breslin and uh, she was brave enough to say yes. And then the rest of a lot of the people that we offered it to were my first choices. And it's very unusual. So I had, um, I had a vision for which actors I wanted to play these historical figures. And we went and we shot some of it in Arizona later on, and first in New Jersey with their principal photography in New Jersey, these towns in New Jersey, Red Bank and Middle, Middletown and um, Mammoth resemble those towns back then. So it was a great place to shoot. And really I had a phenomenal team uh, production designer, costume designer, my first AD, my cinematographer, all people that I will continue to collaborate in the future. And then I have the, I had this extraordinary cast. It really looks great. It uh, came together extremely well on screen and it's very emotional. It's very powerful at the end of that movie. It's very powerful. Thank you. Yeah, we worked really hard. I had a great, you know, family around me and uh, every day was just joyous even a couple of days I was sick because it was still we had the rules of COVID on right, set right but um they let me wear this clear mask that covered my face but um and because we had these scenes we, we shot in an authentic police station of the 60s we shot in an authentic courthouse and so you know there was smoking in that day there's a lot of smoking and some of that smoke came under the mask and um and i got a throat infection i was i remember distinctly so i went and during lunch on one of the days that i was sick to urgent care and the urgent care doctor kept calling me and asking me to go to the emergency room she was afraid that i had developed something in my throat and that it could go to my blood and i could die and i was like well 
if I leave the set now, nothing is being shot. We lose the day. So I said, I'll go, but I have to finish the day first. I've got to finish my shots. And I did. And I went and uh, thankfully they were able to work it out. I didn't have to have surgery. But um, I just remember that, that, you know, in terms of a challenge, that smoke that went into the mask. So you were able to cast, as we've just mentioned, really great actors. I'm just curious. Some of these are big stars. Donald Sutherland's a big star. Andy Garcia is a big star. Ryan Phillippe and Abigail Breslin, et cetera. Do you, when you're directing actors that are known or celebrities, do you treat them differently than everyone else or is everyone treated in the same way? Well, I mean, no, everybody's treated differently based on who they are and, you know, what, what the interaction is. I mean, every actor that comes on set whether they're well known or not well known, is looking to be able to trust their director. They're looking to be able to be safe so that they can play and take some chances um, and embody this character that they're portraying the best that they can. And so they're looking for a dialogue. So, you know, I, I told myself, what the hell am I going to tell Donald Sutherland? <laughs> like, what am I going to say to him? Like nothing. I'm just going to watch him as the rest of the cast did, you know, in, in awe. But I have found as I've worked, you know, with, with, with legends that they want feedback. They want me to say something. And so, um, so I'm happy to offer uh, feedback. Uh, as a matter of fact, I ran into some of the featured actors when I was in New Jersey, and they said, you gave a lot of notes to everybody. Um, I mean, I don't give a lot of notes because the <laughs> danger to giving a lot of notes would be that you immediately shut down an actor. So I'm not going to do that. But, you know, you just have to intuitively see how do you talk to someone? What can you give them? What can you offer them so that they can, you know, play and do something maybe a little bit different so that when I later on I'm in the editing room with my wonderful editor. I have choices. Well, part of the job of a director, obviously, is to be the person who creates the entire uh, feeling of the movie, the tone of the movie, the the thrust of it. It can't be that you have people acting in different movies. It won't look very good. So what is it that you do? How do you approach uh, the notion of here's the story and now I need to make it all of a piece? What is your philosophy toward that? I do a lot of research, first of all, mm -hmm. so I can have conversations and I can inspire everybody so everybody's on the same page, so I can be the captain of the ship and steer them in the right direction. So I, uh, I try as much as possible to do, you know, the most precise research that I can. For instance, now I'm, I'm going to be directing, it looks like uh, a romantic comedy. In, in the heart of this beautiful town in Italy. Um, so I've, I've plunged myself into watching all these movies about people falling in love, which is great and fun. I'd really like to be really well prepared as much as possible so that I can have a very strong vision. And because that's what the captain of the ship has to have and, and be opinionated, you know, and not wishy-washy. Well, Astrologically, I have a Libra moon. And that's a killer for me because when you have Libra in you, and I don't know if you know anything about astrology, you can see it that way, and you can see it that way, and you can see it that way, and you can see it another way, and I can see it a million different ways. And so I have to just say, uh, okay, just pick something and stick with it. Well, I happen to be a Libra. So, oh, that's my favorite sign in the zodiac. So there you go. I I, I get the problem. I see everything. <laughs> it's the best sign. I'm a Capricorn <laughs> astrologically, but I love Libras. And I'm a Capricorn moon. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, that's a difficult moon though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> so I, I'm wondering, once you have a green light on a picture, uh, what is it that you do to get yourself ready for production? Where do you begin? Well, like I, I, I work on the script. I, I create a shooting script. What does that mean? Explain that for those who don't know. What when you say shoot, create a shoot, shooting script? What are you doing? I uh, do some rewrites, offer some rewrites. Uh, I move it around a little bit because uh, there's listen. There's the movie that's on the page, the movie you shoot, and then the movie that you edit. Sure. And one of the things that I've always admired are you know obviously directors like Steven Spielberg that edit in their mind. You know, and they know things 
ahead of time that of course comes with experience. So I try as much as possible to do a visual board, you know, to visualize it. I watch a lot of movies. For instance, I just watched this movie Before Sunrise, which is such a classic to uh, to inspire me. And, you know, I do a lot of um, a lot of watching other other movies. And I think thematically about what I want to say. What is it that uh, that the message of this movie should be? What is it really about? What are the characters really about? So I, I dissect it. I dissect it. I script analyze it. And the more that I can do that work, the easier it is for me when I'm talking to everybody. So you br- you what- break down every character in in your head at least. Yes, absolutely. Because every character, even smaller ones, need an arc. And I try to create that arc. And what else? Then I start to think about casting. And then I just had meetings now. I'm having a great meeting tomorrow morning. I can't say with who, but I'm very excited about this. Um, And then I reach out to actors that I know. I audition some actors. I uh, maybe storyboard, probably not on this one coming up. I did storyboard some of Miranda's victim, the courtroom scenes. Um, I have a great storyboard artist that I love. How important Uh, is that storyboarding to visualizing what you want to do? It depends what the scenes are. For in, I love storyboarding. I mean, it's part of preparation. The more prepared you are, the better it is. I'm uh, going to be directing a movie called Helios, which is a sci-fi uh, thriller, action thriller, which I'm really excited about. It's got all these authentic space companies that are attached, that are sponsoring it. I'll be doing lots of storyboarding on that one. Well, when you're when you're directing action, it's really helpful to have that pre-visualized, isn't it? Oh yeah, no question about it. And uh, you know, so after I have a shooting script, I meet with all the department heads, which I already did on this next movie. I met with the production designer, the costume designer, the sound mixer. I meet uh, I meet with the, the who's going to be my artistic team. I already know who my DP is going to be because I'm uh, bringing in my DP that I've worked with before and my right. first AD, which is crucial to me. I had an incredible first AD and, and DP on Miranda's victim. And my editor, I mean, these are some key positions that, and you know, you have a shorthand with people. So listen, I not to boast, but I'm so lucky. I am surrounded with extraordinary people, extraordinary artists. Makes your life a lot easier when they're good. Yeah, I couldn't be any more grateful than I am. You mentioned casting earlier, and we've also talked about stars, and you're already talking to people and so on. How important to the success of the outcome of any movie or TV show or play, for that matter, is casting? Well, I mean, it's everything, because if you don't cast it right, then it's a problem. So you, hopefully you get it right. Let's say you cast two people as romantic leads and there's zero chemistry. With them. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. Now, can you argue that you can somehow create chemistry? Eh, maybe. I don't know. I have, you know, maybe. Maybe if you up the stakes and, you know, give them things that will make it sizzle. Well, there are stories out in the world of actors who absolutely detested one another, but you can't see it on screen because they were just that good at at pulling it off. But that's not the ideal way to go, right? But that's energy. People that detest each other create a certain energy, and that's good. That's that's good energy because it translates into something. Creates tension. Absolutely. How important is conflict, not between people working, but conflict in a story? Well, I mean, it's everything. If there's not conflict, if there's no obstacle, then there's nothing that you're fighting for. And therefore, as an audience, nothing that you're rooting for. So what's the most fulfilling thing about directing for you? What is it that you love the most? It's the composition. It's all the pieces of the puzzle coming together. Although I don't do puzzles. I bought a lot of puzzles during COVID. I didn't do a single one of them. <laughs> but I think for filmmaking, it would have to be putting the pieces of the puzzle together. No question. It's all a big puzzle piece, isn't it? Right. Yeah, totally. I love the putting together of it. It's like that song in Sunday in the Park with George, that Mandy Patinkin song, you know, putting it together. I love that. Bit by bit. Do you have a particular uh, stratagem that you use when you are developing a scene for where you're going to put cameras, where you're going to, where you want to place the actors, how they move. Do you have some sort of a typical way that you go about that? Or do you feel it out when you're on set? 
Well, when I'm doing my, my walk through my tech scout and I come back, I come back to the location. I definitely start to, you know, uh, brainstorm as to how I'm going to shoot it based on what the scene is about. How am I going to cover the scene? I have preliminary meetings with my director of photography. We do a shot list because that, you know, that's what creates safety in people. When you share your shot list with the rest of the team, then people feel that they can experiment based on the blueprint, the plan that you're giving them. Okay, that's interesting. What do you mean by they feel that they can experiment? How does that work? Well, because everybody, whether you're the gaffer or whether you're, you know, the key grip, everybody, when you think of a key grip or you think of a gaffer, you go, well, that might not be the most artistic position. Um, but actually, it is as well. Um, it is, you know, to really, you know, do that job creatively so that the shot looks great. Everybody, you know, uh, lends their talent. How often do you walk on a set and you think that they're finished, but they, or maybe they are finished, and it's not the way you thought it would be? Does that happen? Mm, not really. Not really. So, so you've got a great I crew. I don't walk away for that long that I would come back and be that surprised. I'd be checking in to make sure it's happening the way I want it. So you've got it set up where people are working at their best level and efficiently at the same time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. No, absolutely. I mean, it has to do with communication and how clear you are. And this is what I want. And this is how I want it. So you've uh, been working with actors forever, not just on as a director, but as an actor and also as an acting teacher. What are the biggest issues that you see with actors who come on sets and maybe aren't quite ready are are really nervous or um, are not really pulling through what you want. What is your technique for, for getting them to, to go where you want them to go? Yeah, I'm just, I put them at ease. I think uh, I've been told that I have a calming <laughs> effect. So I kind of put people at ease and that's happened. People have come on set highly nervous and, you know, it just, it's just, you have to keep it light. It's not all so serious. Even if you're doing a movie about rape, you have to, you know, stay, stay light and stay uh, upbeat and, you know, keep inspiring people to do the best that they can, even if they're struggling. I mean, I have struggled as an actor. I have done, you know, I had to do a scene where I had to cut hair and do this and do that and juggle all these balls and all the lines flew out of my head. And, you know, you just have to, you know, stay calm and just know that you just need one take. Well, sometimes um, actors are re trying to rem remember lines that they memorize not while doing things, right? Then they come on set and they're trying to handle all of the props, the movement and so on, and it throws them, doesn't it? Exactly, that's right. So you have to, um, especially because, you know, a lot with acting, you don't, it's like the bicycle, but the good news is after you haven't ridden the bicycle and you're rusty, you start to ride and then it all comes back. You know, a lot of the times some actors haven't worked for months, so you get rusty and you come mm -hmm. on set. And I mean, I've had that, I've had this, an actor come and I, mean, I remember him particularly because he forgot every single line of the scene and he was struggling and I just put him at ease and say it's okay don't worry about it we'll just keep doing it we'll play you know and, and we finally got it. How important do you think it's been in your directing career that you also have an acting background how important is that? Well, I think that that's great that's really helpful because I understand actors I understand what the work is I know you know, I feel that I know what kind of uh, feedback I can give that can help the scene uh, change and then, you know, take us into maybe either another direction or elevate the choice that's there. Well, so have you ever, and you don't need to name any names, have you ever worked with a director who was not giving that to you, was not helping you? Well, I mean, I worked with a wonderful director as an actress, uh, Henry Jacklin. I don't know if very, very you know well known. Henry is. Sure. <laughs> and so it was a great story. And I wrote him this long letter. So he came to see me on stage do a play because I love theater. And I played a psychic. And he said, I'm going to do this movie called Ovation. Would you play the psychic in this movie? And it go, do you love to improv? He said. And I like lied. I outright said, yes, of course, Henry. I love to improv. <laughs> and the truth is that when I teach classes, 
I advocate loving improvisation for actors. I particularly hate it. I don't like improv for me. I don't like to um, feel like I could be an asshole if I get out of my head like that because I can't control any of the impulses. So I go on set and I'm really pissed off with myself that I said yes to this. And there's no script. There's only an outline. And every scene, you're improvising every scene. So I decide I need to get out of here, I said. So I go to the bathroom and I hide in the bathroom. But they come get me. So then I come and I and I do this scene. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. So he says, um, and this is the first time that Henry worked with HD. He was working on film before. So yeah, we should say that because he didn't call cut for the longest time. So the scene starts and I am in my head. I mean, I'm in my head. I'm so much in pain. I'm like, this is terrible. You suck. I can't wait for this to be over. I have a very <laughs> negative voice that's speaking to me. And we're five minutes into the scene. I'm like, that's it. It's enough. I'm going to cut. I'm cutting. I'm like, no, you can't cut. You're not directing this movie. You're not the director. You cannot cut. You just have to stay in it until somebody else calls, until Henry calls cut. And then I heard the click after it was a 15 minute scene total. Oh. Five minutes in, I heard a click. And the click inside of me went, fuck it. Just get out of your head. And I got out of my head. And I heard, I, I did a lot of different things. I, I hit a lot of different emotions. People were a little bit laughing, you know, behind. It, it, it turned out really good. Fast forward, it's the DGA, it's opening, the movie's opening, it's the premiere. And my scene is quite long, and he basically edited the best moments of those 15 minutes. But, um, you know, I remember thinking I had such a great experience that night. I went home and I couldn't fall asleep because I had gotten out of my head like I had never gotten out of my head before. So I was very, very grateful to Henry for having given me that experience. All right. So explain for the listeners who may not know what you mean when you say gotten out of your head, because actors are very much in their head usually. Yes. It's abandoning mental activity. It's what that wonderful author Edgar Toll says when you have to put a stop button in your mind. It's what you do when you meditate. You just literally, that's why meditation is such, it's such a great tool for actors. You don't think you just do you do you react you be and that's you know one of the things that actors have to embrace is letting go of the thinking process why because great acting is not mental it's not intellectual there's a component of it is intellectual when you script analyze when you think about your character but in the execution of it you must let go fully and are there secrets or tricks to to getting there well, Sandy Meisner taught it in a wonderful way and through a series of exercises, which is take the attention off of yourself and put it on to the other person. Be very immersed with the other person. And that is a great tool for being in the moment. So then how important is listening? That you have to not just listen, but you have to listen actively. You have to listen to what the person is saying underneath what they're saying. And that does that help get you out of your head? Absolutely, because you're not on yourself. So now you have you are already said that you don't like improvisation, and yet that was maybe one of the better things that you turned out doing. Well, yes, and recently I acted in a movie this summer, and all the moments that I love have to do with improvisation, all of them. Well, that gave me a certain confidence working on Ovation, that I could do this improvisation thing that actually I wasn't so bad at it. Well, aren't we basically improvising all day long as humans? Absolutely, but that's <laughs> when you have a camera on your face or well, two. No or kidding. Two. <laughs> so when you're reading a script, because most of the time I'm sure you're dealing with a written script or you're writing it yourself, what is it for you that makes a part attractive? What is it for you that makes a good role good? Well, if there's a lot of colors, if there's a rainbow to it, if there are obstacles, if it's about something, if there's an arc. It's the arc. It's that that transition from what I like to describe as the want to a need throughout a story. You can get that out of a script. Um, most actors can anyway. Absolutely. And also I loved what Helen Mirren said about how she picks her roles. She goes to the last scene of her character. And depending on how her character exits the story is the degree to which she's interested in playing that person. Interesting. She wants to see how that character winds up at the end. Yeah. V very interesting. Are there roles that you absolutely avoid for one reason or another? 
No, I mean, you know, I, I direct more than I act, but uh, no, I, I, you know, I like to play villains and I like to play, you know, good people and, and bad people. <laughs> you know, I think that if you're an actor, you have to embrace range. Is there a difference for an actor uh, who's working on a role that has never been performed before versus you're in a play like like the Rose Tattoo that's been performed many times and is, has iconic performances prior to yours? Is there a difference in the way you approach a role like that? Um, well, I think that when you, for instance, I remember I got a review from the LA Times, which was quite a good review, and it said, Undaunted by Anna Magnani. <laughs> So, yeah, you try, obviously you try not to. And I did. I watched a lot of, I, I watched Anna Magnani and the Rose Tattoo before I did it and was inspired by it. And and I do not feel that I copied that performance in the least, um, but I was definitely inspired by it. Listen, I think it's great if there is something that you can, that you can see or, or if it's, you know, a biopic and it's a real person that you're playing. But if you're creating it from scratch and there's nothing that one can compare it to, that's good too. Do you find that that's that you're freer when it's something no one's ever seen before? Well, for me in the rose tattoo, I felt very free because my mother was Italian. And so I had that blood memory to go with. And so that freed me. So I, I didn't certainly did not feel I didn't feel the pressure of, oh, this is a great play by um you know Tennessee Williams or or Anna Magnani immortalized it on screen I, I didn't feel any of that you you came um, to it as if it were you nobody had ever done it you were doing it fresh right, well it hadn't been done in LA when we did it and it's funny you asked me this because uh we hadn't we hadn't it hadn't been performed in 18 years nobody could get the rights to it and I only got the rights to it by a fluke because I had been promised the rights of Orpheus descending and they ended up by mistake giving it to somebody else. And so by a fluke, then said, you know what, I'm going to give you the rights to the Rose Tattoo. Wow. Play service. And I knew this wonderful actor, Rob Estes, who at the time was on Melrose Place. And we started to work on it, had a wonderful director, Deborah Levine, who now heads the film department up in North Carolina. And um, and we it ran for almost a year with 21 people in the cast and a goat. And we won awards. It was a great experience. So fast forward the clock. Um, so how many years later would that be? Maybe 20 years later. 20 Al years Almost later. 20 years later. 18 years later. 19 years later. I have a script that is sent to me called The Italians. And I really like the story. I felt it had a lot of heart. It was about... Um, this mother who has her son bring home this girlfriend and she becomes the worst nightmare uh that uh she's like the the, the girlfriend from hell and i thought i have to call rob to do this because him and i 20 years ago did the rose tattoo and had such great chemistry and we've remained friends since and he came and he played so he's in the italians with me which now is going to actually premiere at the Italian American Film Festival at the Chinese Theater March 4th. Uh, I'm in post production for that movie. But, uh, and so it's great because this, this relationship between Vincenzo, the character that Rob plays, and my character, Angelina, it's like we really have this texture of a relationship. This couple has been married for 30 years, and that's for almost as long as Rob and I have known each other. Wow. So oh, it's it's great. The fact that you brought up the rose tattoo just reminded me that we had a great experience doing that play. And now, in a way, this the Italians, this movie that I just shot this summer, is an homage to that. In a way, nice. That's very nice. What do you think that you have learned over time from the better directors you've worked with? What tips or tricks from those directors have you learned? Um, to really have a vision for for the story. You really have to have a, a strong vision because that's the only way you're going to inspire a whole group of people. I think that's really fantastic. Um, I, I am curious, actors have to memorize lines. Is there something that you teach actors about memorization to help them figure out how to keep lots of lines in their head? I mean, I like this idea of recording the other person on your phone and then leaving a space for your lines because then it really trains you to listen and to really be affected and to be aware who, what are you answering? 
Um, so I like that particularly, and I like just picking up the script and taking your dialogue and trying different intentions through the dialogue. I think that helps physicalizing. I just don't think that, I mean, I know there's some people that it's hard to commit to memory, and but I think that the more you do it, the body has muscle memory, so it retains it. Where you can get a little, um, you know, thrown off is that if you know the dialogue, but then in the moment, you have to add the physical activity that can really, you know, plunge you back into your head. So I think that if you have a physical activity, you have to, you really should rehearse it like that. It's interesting. I've had the great privilege of speaking with a number of soap opera actors, and they all say sort of the similar thing that when they start out, they don't know how they're going to remember all those lines. And then over time, it just gets really easy for them because it is like muscle memory, as you say. Do, do you find that, that when you've been acting, that the more that you've acted, the easier it gets? I think so. That's absolutely, that's why I think it's saying the same group of actors keeps acting. And then there's a whole group of actors that unfortunately doesn't get opportunities. So, um, you know, that's why work gets you work. So today, most actors that are going to audition for something in Hollywood are going to do it probably from home on a camera or a cell phone or something like that. Uh, and then set, submit that as opposed to going to an office and auditioning in front of a casting director or a director. What advice do you give to your students about uh, the best way to approach auditioning to try and land a role? To really understand the tone of it, to understand, you know, what's the world of the story and as much as possible, because I think people hire actors based on how they understand that. Not uh, just their looks. Oh, no, no, no. It's understanding the tone of the story, uh, the genre, and how does your character fit in into, into the puzzle. And if you see that the actor understands that, then you can see how they can be part of it. So what does an actor do if they're not given the whole or given any advice as to what the tone of the whole piece is? How do you see through that? How do you figure it out? You can figure it out based on what is given to you on the scene. And if it really is not clear, then when you get in there, just, you know, you start a conversation. I mean, not the gone with the wind conversation because people are in a hurry, but you start by, you just ask a few questions and, and see if you can get clarity or call the office and or call your agent or your manager and see if they can get you as much information as possible mm -hmm. so you know what you're walking into. And that's very smart. Uh, you know, Research the people that you're auditioning for. So you understand, I mean, usually directors in a way, I mean, not literally, but in a way they direct the same movie over and over again, in a way. Um, so research the director, research the writer. That's very, very wise. I want to speak to you for a moment about your coaching that you do, because you've done a lot of that too. Do you enjoy it? Is coaching fun for you? Do you, you enjoy it? Very much so. I really like the one-on-one. -on -one. I like the, the in-depth conversation with the actor, whether they're working on a project or it's just general to come and just you know, work on their instrument. I, I like very much that process, yes. Uh, I, I'm wondering if you, like me, um, sometimes get more from your students than you give to them. Um, well, I, hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I find that I learn things by teaching people. I, I definitely always get, you know, something from every interaction, including this one right now. But uh, you know that that's not uh, the mandate right <laughs> when somebody well comes i, I i'm being a little hyperbolic when i say i get more from them than, than yeah. they get from me when but somebody comes for a coaching it's really you have to be of service to them. <laughs> yeah. it, well that's true you are of service to someone else and and their dreams and their desires and their uh, ability to learn what for you makes a good or an ideal student who who do you prefer to work with somebody that's really into it or someone that's a little bit challenging for you well, no, I mean, I definitely somebody who's into it, somebody, and if, you know, if they're not into it, then, you know, you try to get them there and raise the bar for them. And, and if it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be, but as much as possible, um, if people come to you, and I know I've had instances where people have come and, you know, they haven't really been into it, but for whatever reason, they landed this part, but it happens, it happens that people are not into it. And therefore, you know, you try, 
usually because I'm able to talk about the emotional circumstances that are given, I can get them into it. It's very rare that I'm not able to. So how important do you think is teaching to directing? Are directors teachers as well? You know, Dereo, listen, you could argue that everything, everything in life teaches you something. Everything, everybody's a teacher. But um, it's a very different process. You know, when you direct, there's a lot of balls that are in the air. Mm -hmm. You don't have time to teach acting on set. So hopefully people come and it's collaborative and there's choices and there's a conversation. But when you teach acting, then you really dig into the process. And, uh, and I think it's a fascinating conversation, both for the actors, let's say if it's a scene study class that are acting on the platform and, thus, and, and those that are watching the process. And then when people bring back the work, they bring back the scene from week to week and you see the progress. I mean, and light bulbs go off. I love that process. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's really great to see that light bulb go off in a student's eyes. And they go, oh, I get it. Oh, and there's nothing that's, better that's for the whole me. joy of teaching. That is the whole joy of teaching, no doubt. So I've been having this marvelous conversation with Michelle Danner. You've clearly worked with and met tons of people in the entertainment industry. And I'm wondering if you can share with us a story that's either weird, quirky, offbeat, strange, or just plain funny from all of your experiences. Well, it wasn't weird or strange. It was just that we were hit with thunderstorms on Miranda's victim. And I, well, actually, it was like the most challenging day. So it's the last day of the shoot. And I have 27 setups that I need to get. And earlier in the day, I was swimming in this pool, this house that we rented on the ocean. And this bird comes <laughs> to the edge of the pool. And I'm like talking to this bird. See, that's a weird story. I'm telling this bird, how the fuck am I going to get 27 setups in one day? Like, that's not possible. And I have this conversation, this bird lingers for a very long period of time. So I go on set and I gather everyone and I say, okay, well, this is what I need to get today. And everybody's telling me, you're completely crazy. It's just not going to happen. And I just said, watch me. And it was the most incredible day of shooting. We went back to the bus stop, that location that we had lost because of the thunderstorms. And I knew that I was gonna hit meal penalties. I had five minutes. And I needed to get the scene where the police car is driving with the, if I, I would never have gotten it on that street. And I said, move this, move that. I got it in one take. Normally you do more than one take, but I go, and I hit that. It's like, okay, cut. Let's move to the next location on the ocean where we we're going to shoot the rape scene, which I had allocated a whole entire day for that. Now I only have less than five hours to do that. And so we get there and you know, my DP is like, well, you know, you can only shoot until, you know, four o'clock because the light comes up. Nothing is going to come out good in the car. And I'm like, oh, well, no, let's black out the windows. I'm going in myself handheld and I'm going to get it. And lo, lo and behold, I couldn't believe it. But we stopped shooting exactly at 530. We did not go through one more minute of overtime. And I got all 27 setups that day. And I had told my wonderful housekeeper that I was going to be home at 7 a.m. And I walked into the house exactly at 7 a.m., not at 6.59 a.m., not at 7.01. So I stayed on his schedule and I went back and I was shell-shocked for a second there. I was like, how did you get this? And I was like, it's that bird, isn't it? That bird, <laughs> was that was that's my weird story. It's always a bird in movies that is like the... <laughs> The, the harbinger of something's going to come, good or bad, but it's, a, it's frequently a bird. <laughs> I find that very funny and interesting. So last question for you today, Michelle. You've already given us a huge amount of advice and lots of stuff to chew on uh, throughout this entire show, but I'm wondering if you have a single solid piece of advice or a tip that you like to give to people who are just starting out in the business, or maybe they're in a little bit and trying to get to the next level. Study, be patient great, but study. I see the things that I didn't do when I was younger. And I see the things that my son does. He literally watches, I want to say four movies a day, probably not that many, but he watches at least a couple every day. And he studies them and he has the ability to watch them over and over and over again. And that was the defense mechanism that I had when I was younger that I did not want to do. And I think it robbed me from the ability to go deeper 
in my craft. So the degree to which you're willing to watch things over and over again and study them and absorb them, I think is a, is a great tool for any artist. I think that's extraordinarily wise advice, and I'm very glad that you shared that with us because I think study is everything. Uh, if you don't study your craft and you don't study the people that came before you, you're probably going to stumble around until you maybe figure it out if you're lucky. But you have this opportunity to sit on the shoulders of the giants who came before you, and that's really helpful. Michelle Danner, this has been a terrific hour on Story Beat, and I can't thank you enough for your time, your energy, your wisdom, and for just these fabulous stories of your uh, working your way through the industry. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. StoryBeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable. <laughs>